My name is Chris Turnier. I've been in this industry for hobby, well, long time. Um, I started as a little guy, you know, just freshwater tanks. I even had trout, largemouth bass, I had all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's developed into, well, managing, right, currently I manage Worldwide Coral's web department. Um, I got, I think, eight people in my department. We ship, I don't know, 5,000 packages a year of corals, thousands and thousands of corals. Uh, but this is kind of like a, a history of the, of, the, of the hobby as we know it. Um, and basically, it's, it started with, it all starts with this. Whatever we do, it all starts here. You got, a, you got basically, you got reefs full of corals, full of fish, and you do what you can to make every, to be able to propagate things. So you've got reefs everywhere on the, in, in the equatorial regions. Beautiful, spectacular reefs. And from these reefs, you actually have to collect these corals. And those corals become eventually something like this. This is what we're seeing throughout the show today for the most part. And those corals, if you do it properly, can grow into this. Now this is actually one of the main display tanks, propagation tanks, rootstock tanks that we have at Worldwide Corals. Spectacular. So you can see this is what the, our main 900 rootstock gallon at Worldwide Corals looks at currently. It's spectacular. We have over four, 400 different, maybe 500 different varieties of corals in that tank alone. But they all have to start somewhere. So as you can see from the propagate, from the display here, starts there at the reef. Then it goes to the colony. Now this colony then can be turned into a mariculture colony or directly into a frag. And then this frag then becomes a colony. That's the hope, right? And back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's what the hope is. So what I mean by back and forth is as you grow things out, like Worldwide Corals does, we grow things out, we, we snap off a frag, we glue it, we ship it, we sell it, and then the next person does the same thing. This is the goal. It's the only way we can make this continue to happen. Seems simple enough, right? But to get to this point, is, it's, it takes a lot. And that's the hard thing. When you're, when you're just a reefer and you have a hobbyist in a reef tank, it's hard to know where this comes from. And to some it's, it's not important, but to others I think it is very important because what's happening right now, and I will get to this later, it's a little bit, it's a little bit scary because we, don't, we might not have the sources anymore like we used to. So here's just a few more examples of the reefs that we, you know, that, that when I was in Fiji, where we collected from. I mean, spectacular vistas of corals that go on forever or so it seems. I mean, reef tops that were, you know, that you're only four feet, five feet deep. Okay, so it all started for me to get a, a, a direct look at, was at Walt Smith International. I was there for four years in Fiji. It directly employed 80, 80 people, 80, 80 islanders. Indirectly, it employed about 300. So Goli Golis, which I'll get to here in a moment, allowed for Fiji, where we were collecting from, and the islands there, it allowed for separate territories to be collected from. So you collect a colony from, a, from, a ter uh, from this particular body of water, but it, it allowed only one collector from per, per territory. It's pretty cool. It's a really neat system. So you, what happens is you don't get over harvesting from one area to another. So the villagers became shepherds of the reef. Because what happens is if you don't have shepherds of the reef, what happens? You get people trying to build on those reefs. You get, um, you get hotels coming in. You get the reefs, basically the reefs become destroyed. But if you're a shepherd, you want to protect that reef. You want to keep those colonies intact. Pretty interesting though, is that it's an extremely sustainable industry because of the fact that you're only collecting 0.001% of the population. They say that forestry actually can collect up to 3% of a population and not have any issues. 
So here's an example of, the, of these different territories that were in Fiji. You have every one of those particular, every one of those little red signatures there, that's a territory. And from those, you can, you can only collect from that particular territory, just like a state, like you have California, you got Florida. You got, so these were particular sections of water that were set aside just for Walt Smith to collect from. He couldn't collect out of those because it was illegal. So out of those areas, you had up to 3,000 square miles to collect from. Pretty amazing. So it's, they're defined as a customary fishing right. And the villages benefit, therefore benefited from those particular gully gullies, those villages that controlled those gully gullies, benefited from that because of the fact that it would support them. And they were also the shepherds of the reef. So it reduces the chance for overexploitation and increases the local employment that you can see from those particular regions. So what I'm trying to get at is that you have you have this big broad ocean with all these corals in it, much more so than one realizes. And if you're only collecting a certain percentage of it, it's got to be sustainable. So with these corals that we're, we're collecting, you have to go out and a means, so Walt Smith had all these, these fleet of ships that you go out and collect these particular corals from these regions. Obviously you can't collect in an area with huge massive waves. You can't collect from an area with high siltation. Nor can you do it from an area that's, that has, that's out of water for many hours of the day. So you have to find the right spots. Now the cool thing is, is that you've got, a, you've got teams that come in that would come into each of these territories to check to make sure that it was a sustainable collection. Every three or four years they would come in. This particular example, that's actually Bruce Carlson, which is kind of neat. We actually dove with him several times to take him to these particular areas to collect from that we collected from. He'd have one that was a, a, uh, outside of our collection area and the one that was inside of our collection area. And every th so often he would come and check to make sure that what we were doing was not harming the environment. So you can see from a lot of the examples that, was, that I've got here that these were areas that we were collecting from. So if you can imagine 0.001% of that particular reef we were taking one coral here, one coral there. So when we go through these particular reef areas, that's what you would collect. You would collect these. That was basically my day's catch, for one example. You take those corals, you'd wrap them, you place them on the boat. They would then there be placed into, brought back to the Walt Smith's warehouse and placed into these raceways for export and this is basically you have to have, so you go from the boat onto, or you go from the ocean, you collect those corals, you put them on the boat, put them in tubs, you bring them back here and then you check for health and then you export them. So that's where the next stage of my, what I was doing was in Reefer Manus. Now Reefer Manus is actually a facility in, in United States, actually Southern California and we would receive these corals every week from, uh, from Walt Smith and from Tonga and other places uh, because that's where all the, the wholesalers were. They're located in Southern California. And on average, we would, we would get in two to 300 colonies per week. Strictly, basically, reefer madness was strictly colonies for three to four years. Now remember, this is, you know, 10, 15 years ago. We had th five 1,000 watt bulbs on each, on one raceway for m most of the colonies, and then another one had 400 watt, 20K bulbs. And this is basically because you're getting these corals, majority of them were, were Acropora, and you would actually need to provide them with an amazing, incredible amount of light. You can't, unfortunately, with the LEDs that we predominantly use now, most colonies do not do well. So, the main point I want to get at is, these colonies at, while I was at Walt Smith's, 90% of them were made, 90% of our sales were colonies. It's changed, man, has it changed. So this is, you know, 15, well, 10 years ago at the, at the last where I was at Reefer Madness, but, so just think, just 10 years ago, 90%, 
And this is pretty much industry-wide. 90% of the colonies, 90% of the sales were colonies. So that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to get at. It's done a complete flip. So these are some examples where we're trying to sell these colonies. We have these, you know, this is the website. We have these crazy names for each of them because they're not like today where you have specific names for specific corals. And here's what an incoming system. There's a long time ago, my guy Chris Ray. There's my son helping out. And this is basically what it looked like. This is kind of a close up of the system. You can just see colonies galore. There's some frags on the, ex on the outsides of it. So what I'm showing you now are some of the colonies that we would get from Fiji, that we would import directly from Fiji and Tonga. And a lot of these you don't see anymore. And that's something, like I said, I'll get to a little bit later because this is incredibly important for the future of what we're doing. Some species, just, some species that you just don't, you don't really see, or you might see, but amazing diversity there. And this is not even the apex. Like Indonesia, for example, is the apex of diversity of colonies that you find. And some of these are very hard to grow. You can't, they're very difficult to propagate. But we gotta keep trying, we gotta keep trying. Got some amazing millies, millipora, some different staghorn, nobilis, paniculata, sakali. And the reason why I know these scientific names so well is just I had to actually do it while exporting from Fiji, while we were running the, while I was running that facility for CITES, for be clear, to be cleared at the, at the airports, you actually had to know, um, identify each of those species by scientific name. Just incredible. There was always something special about it. But some species that you don't even see really as much anymore. A few different chalices. The Fiji chalices are, are very, for whatever reason, are kind of difficult to keep in, a, in, the, in our reefing community as it is now to propagate. Same with the different monopora species. So these are all colonies that we collected from Fiji. Ulophilia, different pavona. There's a pavona duardini, which is kind of neat, different species. So what I'm getting to is that we also have colonies that were collected that we really shouldn't touch. Euphelia, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cataphilia, basically Ellen's corals, they shouldn't be, even be collected. However, there still should be research done by some of those that have larger systems to be able to fragment those and, and propagate them. But unfortunately, there are some corals like we still have that are difficult. The only way that you can fragment them, or I'm sorry, the only way you can grow them out is by having them produce babies because they cannot, they don't handle being fragged. So back in the day, we actually had uh, farms in Fiji too, farms in Fiji and in Tonga. And then, so we also try to mariculture a lot of these colonies, which is pretty cool. But as a lot of corals go, you can't, you can't, you can't farm all corals. You can try, but you can't farm them. And so if you can't farm them, you gotta stick with certain species that you can't, that you know do well in the industry. So it was pretty neat. In Tonga, when I was there, I went there three times, I think. You, you basically created these plugs, these cement plugs, like you got nowadays with the, with little plugs, but actually have, these are much larger plugs that handle the flow that you'd find in the ocean. And you set it up and you, you, you cure them on these made out of cement, then place them in these tubs. And then a lot of times you actually move them uh, either out into the sun so they could grow or out into the ocean where you set up these racks. And this is called ex situ coral mariculture. But unfortunately this is becoming a albatross because it's with the closures that we're seeing today, these are gonna start disappearing as well. So the coral farms are disappearing. But what we did have are some amazing varieties of corals that we had. From Stylophora to Millipora. They also were doing it in Fiji since basically 1996. At one time we had 30 thousand frags on over 50 racks in the ocean, different, different, different level farms at different depths, trying to figure out what would do well for the industry. Not only would they grow well for us, but also be accepted by the hobbyists on the final 
when they, once they were imported and sold. So just like you do here with display tanks, you have, you know, you have your colonies that you wanna grow out. And as a hobbyist, that's your goal, right? To have larger colonies that you can grow and fragment. Well, we have the same thing in, in Fiji, but just on racks. So you allow these racks to grow out and grow and grow and grow and try not to touch them. Because if you, if you hit a frag too many times, it'll stop growing. This is an amazing little, well, not little so much, but this is Acropora nobilis and it grew three inches a month. It was incredible. If I didn't, if we glued it down and didn't collect it in time, it would outgrow itself and then we couldn't touch it. It wasn't, it wasn't fit for ship out. So there's a few more species that we were farming. And this is kind of neat. This is actually a rack that we had that we lost. How do you lose a rack? Well, we actually had what was called a it was a, it was a uh, kind of an ecotourism thing. On a, there, was a, there was a resort in southern Fiji called Hideaway. And we did this uh, thing where uh, tourists would come and take corals from what we fragmented, what we collected, and place that actually on the ocean to repopulate the local environment. But once in a while, those racks would go missing. We couldn't find them because we were only down there every few months because most of the time the tourists could, took care of them. So this is a rack that we actually left out for about, well, we couldn't find it for, I don't know, two years? And we came back and it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty neat. It was, it was exciting stuff. I, I mean, I love seeing that. Now, when you have these racks, you actually have to come and clean them all the time. So you have an under, basically undesirable coral recruitment. It's a great thing to have sometimes. I don't know if anybody's ever had the problem where you have pasta lapora in your reef and it starts popping up all over the place. Well, similar things on the ocean happen. It happens that way, where you just, you have to come and you actually have to clean, just like taking care of bryopsis in your system or aptasia or whatever. You have the same kind of problems out in the ocean where you get these corals that start growing all over your racks. So you actually have to come and try to remove those and they'll settle, you know, below the racks. Now, same thing with water quality. If your water quality system in your reef, in your own reef, goes fouls, you'll get the same problem out in the ocean. And this is the same place at the Hideaway Resort where you had runoff coming from untreated water, both runoff from their, from their gardens, from their nurseries, also from um, sewage. And you get algae blooms that would ruin a rack. It would make it so that we could not sell these particular animals. This is the goal. So here I'm holding a colony that was probably a stylophora. So you take, you take branches, just like we do, take branches from that colony, place it onto the cement, and let it grow out. And that would be, that's basically a perfect export, maricultured export colony. So if it's done right, this is what the racks look like. So once they're done, you, get, you collect them, you bring them back up on the boat. Different variety of different racks that we've used. And then here's just a little video of one of the farms that one of the racks, one of the farms that I had set up, all the, a lot of the broodstock corals that we had. So you can see the size of a lot of these corals that we are growing out for broodstock. From Stylophora to Acropora. Mainly SPS is what we concentrated on there, so mainly small polyp stony corals as that was at the time, well, it actually still is, um, the easiest, probably the easiest thing to farm. But some of these corals you can see really wouldn't, because of the growth rates that we'd have there, they really weren't that, really weren't that old. It didn't take a whole lot of work there, which is nice if it was done well. And we did farm some soft corals, Clavularia, as you just saw, there's some Cinularia. And then you can see the reef coverage there is incredible. But remember, we were talking about 0.001% of that coral, of that colony, that reef right there was collected for colonies. So once again, it's sustainable. So now I go to worldwide corals. This is kind of the change. This is where it changes from colonies now to frags. So Vic and Lou and Ryan started this in their garage, 2006. 
funny enough, I went to Fiji, started working in Fiji in 2007. It's grown from just those three guys to now 27 employees. So we have over 15,000 gallons dedicated to farming corals. The diversity that we can see there, is pre it's pretty neat, it's pretty cool. We have, oh, I don't know, four or 500 different varieties of corals now that we're trying to propagate. So the diversity that we see is, is, is it's incredible. So now, this remember I talked about earlier with Reefer Madness, 90% of the corals that were sold in 2000, what was it, 2001, 2002, has now changed to what it is today in 2017 to 90% of frags being sold. So the flip is, is remarkable. So this is the future. I mean, doing this is absolutely the future of what we've got to do. So if we don't grow it, there's a good chance we might not ever see it again. So this is kind of, this is uh, Vic looking at us. Back in 2012, I went down there for, uh, for a show, I think, when I was working at a different company, Sustainable Aquatics. And then this is what it is today. So if you guys know who Casper is, the white tang, the famous white tang. So this is back in 2012, this is Casper's tank. And then there he is today in full glory. And remember, all every single coral in this tank is grown from a frag. So if you think to back to Walt Smith, when we're collecting his colonies out in the ocean, those started, that's basically where all these corals started. They started in Indonesia, they started in Fiji, they started in, and now they're imported and they're growing out over time. So in 2015, when we started this the amazing 12 foot tank that we've got, you can see that the, the corals are just a bunch of sticks. All taken from eventually, you know, at some point, some are signature corals, like Tyree lemonade, pink lemonade, uh, you've got uh, Ore Pearlberry, you've got Ore Neon Bird's Nest, you've got all sorts of corals that were started years and years and years ago that we're trying to propagate. And then and this, two years later, this is what we've got. Different chalices that we grow out, rainbow chalices. Those are like the apex of LPS corals. So now I'm gonna show you basically the same thing, colonies, to frag, remember that previous slide I was showing you of going from colony to frag one way or another. And you can see as they grow out. So each of those corals, this is before the previous, previous slide, frags, now colonies. Frag, like pink lemonade, Tyree pink lemonade, WWC sour punch, to colonies. So this is the goal, this is the goal for everybody. Same, more of the same, Jason Fox, Fox Flame, Stylophora, Monopora, Alter Ego, both of them grown out. Different Monopora species that we've got to grow out <coughs> to all this beauty, this beautiful corals that you can see here, they're spectacular. Now all these photos were taken straight out of the 900 gallon I just showed you. Same thing, some of the corals in here, amazing. Different, you got Acropora, you got Cyphastria, you got different mushrooms, Favia, the famous budgie smuggler, which I don't want to scare anybody, but um, French tickler, I didn't say that, did I? Okay, little red Ferrari. Space Invaders, and these all grown from colonies that came from the ocean. Some are even done on tiles. This makes it a little bit easier for us to propagate them. You can cut the tiles, cut the new growth out. So if you ever look at, still have the access to buying colonies, it's pretty cool, because you can instant centerpiece, lots of bang for the size. Good for beginners if you concentrate on, say, LP, uh, softies, leathers, some LPS. Aquaculture frags, kind of neat because you can grow them out, you can nurture them if you're a gardener. So many have a well-known history, they've been around the hobby for a long time. 
There's a little color shift because they adapted to our lighting that we have now, mainly LEDs. And they adapt really quickly, provide um, incredible amount of diversity. Because if you just focus on colonies, you're not gonna get the diversity you can because you're filling up your tank so quickly. And they can grow really adapt really quickly to, um, to your tank. So now the issues with some of the colonies you might see, and this is a delayed reaction, is that you've got boring sponges. So if you ever get a colony, you purchase a colony, you'll notice that they're, they're a funky smell. And that funky smell will actually cause the coral to rot out. And it can also take a long time for those col these colonies to adapt. They need a crazy amount of light. Remember I was mentioning before, reef, my at days at Reefer Madness, we had five 1,000 watt halides over those, over those tanks. So with those 5,000 watt halides, the corals adapted really well. But now, with the LEDs for the most part, they don't adapt as, as easily. Now parasites are kind of an issue with colonies, but not so much. And then there's an unknown survivability factor because a lot of times when you're buying those colonies, you know they're gonna be able to adapt to your system. They take a long time, like I said. If it's something, the longer something takes to adapt to your system, the harder it is for those to know whether that coral is going to make it or not in the long run. Now, mariculture colonies, you have to be aware of parasites. The reason why you have to be aware of parasites are because you don't know you got all these corals growing on the same rack, the parasites can actually propagate just as well, just as easily as the colonies can, the parasites can, can also propagate. So you have to be very careful with, colon, with mariculture colonies. Now they also, also have a re re reasonably hard time adapting because of the fact that they're grown out in the sunlight most often. And then Acropora, which one of our main focuses, it's kind of the apex of the hobby. They also need incredible high, high, low, high flow and high light. And they can eventually do re reasonably well with LEDs. The aquaculture frags on the other hand, they can be expensive, very expensive for the size. And parasites can also be a problem because of the fact that, and as you guys know, or well aware, I don't need to discuss it, something's been discussed many times, but lots of people, when they get well, good with propagating corals, also develop parasites. And you just have to take care of yourself to make sure that you quarantine these corals coming in from whatever vendor you might get it. Worldwide corals is no different. So just be careful whatever you do, no matter how hard you try. So just be careful, careful with frags because they can be lodged, easily lost or dislodged. And then also as you grow all these corals, you pr purchase them, say at a show like this, they, dis they can disappear in your system. So you have to be patient. The closures that are happening here uh, as of late, Hawaii I think was what, last year? Um, Fiji just within the last six months and now Indonesia within the last few months. It's basically gonna sh change the way we do things if these continue or if they stay shut. Cause I've heard some, from, from some folks that Indonesia will come, should be, might be back in six months to a year, but it's hard to say. Cause if they don't, these closures are gonna change everything. So mariculture, which happened with these collection, cause the only way you can do mariculture is by collecting corals out in the wild because you had to have a source from somewhere. So if you don't have that source anymore, you're not gonna have any more new blood of corals coming into the industry. So it's my plea is to make sure that whatever colonies we've got right now, whatever corals we've got, we've gotta make sure that you guys, worldwide corals, wholesalers, Everybody's doing their part to learn as much as you can to grow these corals because a lot of these corals that we see are going to disappear from the source. So if we have no corals coming from the source, we have to do what we can to try and propagate these corals because with global warming, for those that believe it or those that don't, it's going to change the environment as we see it. So the unfortunate part about these closures is that the governments that control the fisheries don't understand that the amount of corals that are actually collected 
are incredibly sustainable. But they don't see it that way. They see, they see shipments being sent out. They see corals being extracted. But they don't see the vastness of the reef that you said. Remember I was saying that they had how many hundreds of miles? I think it was several hundred square miles of reef that you collect from. And you're only taking 0.001% of those corals. It's in insignificant. What we're doing is insignificant. But the problem is you've got a lot of environmentalists and governments out there that don't really know, and I'm an environmentalist, but to be an environmentalist, you have to be educated about every, every little thing. And those that are coming to do, to make changes, to shut down these source countries, don't see the overall picture. They don't see what we're doing. No matter how my, small what we're working with, a small fragment, we're doing really important things. And they don't, they don't realize that. So my plea to you is a lot of those colony photos that I showed you before, some of those corals like Ulophilia, for example, and Pavona Duardini and um, Australogyra, you don't see those colonies in the industry right now. So my, like I said, my plea is to try and do whatever you can to propagate these corals, to make sure that we nurture these corals and to grow these corals and make sure, because in some ways, if we lose the ocean, for whatever, now I do hear that it's adapting, but if we lose it, we're not gonna have anything left. We're not gonna have the source, the source coming in. The source is gonna stop, and it has. Like Walt Smith, for example, I've heard they just left Fiji. They've been shut down. There's nothing, it seems like there's nothing they're gonna do. They're, they're looking to do an, uh, an environmental impact study, like I showed before, where they do transects. They're, it's not, it, it, they've left. They've left, they moved to Las Vegas from what I understand. So, a lot of these corals from these different areas in the world are, we're not gonna get them anymore. So maybe what we've got right now, other than say Australia, is still, who's still importing in the United States, if we don't care for what we've got now, we might not have anything left because, like I said, all those racks, all the corals that we had, all the collection that I made back in the day, collecting those corals on the reef, it's not gonna happen anymore. Or if it does, it's gonna be very reduced. So my plea is for the wholesalers because if the wholesalers, they can't, they're, they're, they were basically importing and then distributing throughout the United States, sending to stores, sending to other wholesalers, sending to stores, and the stores to the retailer, uh, to the hobbyist. So if, if that isn't happening anymore, we've got to do absolutely everything in our power to make sure that we can make continuous, continue this. Because otherwise, what we have is going to, what we have is going to disappear or it's going to become a much more reduced. And I don't want to be doomsday, but this is, to me, it's pretty scary because I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've seen it where before where we weren't really making much of an effort to try and um, save. We're going for the brightest coral, the most spectacular coral, the most, the fastest growing. And that's important because that's the way to get new hobbyists into the industry or into our hobby. But we've also got to pay attention to a lot of those corals that we, we, we don't grow, that grow slower, maybe not as quite as attractive. For me, I love, I mean, I'm just, I'm all about coral. I mean, I love fish, I love coral, but I'm, I'm, I'm a coral guy, I have always been. And I see a lot of corals that have disappeared. So whatever you guys can do to make that continue to happen, to grow these corals, is, is, is really is the future in my opinion. These are some of my divers in Fiji, great guys, every single one of them. They were, they actually, they were the shepherds. They went out into the ocean every day, they collected, they worked on my farms, they were amazing. They could hold their breath for two, three minutes sometimes. They, were, they stayed in the ocean like I did for four years, F five days a week, six, seven hours a day, just surrounded in an ocean, sat on the water. You get back on the boat, you're pass out within 10 minutes, you're so tired, it's unbelievable. But these guys don't have a job anymore. They're out of a job. So what do they probably do now? A lot of the guys, they start collecting cucumbers for export. It's not, that's not a sustainable collection. It's cucumbers, I don't know if you guys know, but 
sea cucumbers, for example, very slow growing, but they eat them. They, they, uh, a lot of Asian countries eat them. Um, but unfortunately, they're not the shepherds of the reef anymore. They're going out and collecting something that isn't sustainable anymore. So it's kind of sad when you start seeing these when you start seeing these closures. But these guys are out of a job. In Indonesia, all the people that were collecting there, out of a job. What are they going to do now? I don't know. But I can tell you that they're probably not shepherding the reef anymore. They're not protecting it the way we should be. Now, Walt and Deb, he did what he could for a long time. Neat guy, started way back early 90s in Tonga and then moved to Fiji. Did whatever he could. So, this is the future. This is just taken on Wednesday, last, just a week ago. This is basically the crew at Worldwide Corals. We're trying to do what we can to farm as many corals as we can. Um, and I can't, I can't stress that enough. I can't stress how important it is for every hobbyist, every company involved in this industry to make the change. Because if we don't have the source corals coming in from these, from, from these countries, this will become a much smaller hobby. These are some of the corals, the colonies that, we'd, that I'd see diving. Spectacular. And they're probably still there to this day. And I hope that they will continue long into the future, get larger and larger. Beautiful reef scenes that I would see diving from day to day. That was actually a, a cave that I dove through, looked up and you can see the light coming through, it was amazing. It's spectacular. Miss it every day. 